Bankers whisper to politicians, socialism will make you rich. Sixty years behind the throttle, the new world is right on track. The United Nations Army will enforce their global plan. From Roosevelt to Clinton, they're traitors every man. Congress sold out the country, our treasury is broke. You can't redeem America with federal reserve notes. The ballot box quit working, the cartridge box is freedom's key. It's all over but the fighting, the fat lady's about to sing. They stole our silver, they stole our gold, they took our steel, they took our coal. They stripped our trees and robbed our roads and sold our jobs to Mexico. Congress sold out the country, our treasuries broke. You can't redeem America with Federal Reserve notes. The ballot box quit working, the cartridge box is freedom's key. It's all over but the fighting, the fat lady's about to sing. You can call me a right wing wacko, I read the writings on the wall. I also read the Bible, God's hammer's about to fall. Sold out. The ballot box quit working. The fat lady's about to sing. our program to bring you a special broadcast. The German news agency... We interrupt this program to bring you a news bulletin from Washington. Special report. Verdict sparks violence. National Guard... Local governments um, almost have to go with their hat in their hand. Because we don't answer to the taxpayers or to your congressman. And we don't take no from anyone. We just want to take your land. Now we'd like to talk about that barn You plan to build out in your backyard We have a special building fee Just give us 40 acres free Cause we don't answer to the taxpayers Or to your congressman and we don't take no from anyone, we just want to take your land. And if you don't comply, we have ways to change your mind. We'll do almost anything to get our way. So just sign the dotted line, it's for the good of all mankind. <clears throat> now scheduled coming up in about 15 minutes, we're going to have Walter Burian on to talk about the biggest game in town, one of the biggest scams uh, in the world, not just in this country. And frankly, you're not going to hear this uh, anywhere else. We're going to be talking about the comprehensive annual financial reports. Uh, I actually have the comprehensive annual financial report uh, from 1999, and this is from the comptroller's office, Karen Carol Keaton Rhinelander, Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts. And this is a scaled-down comprehensive financial report. It's only 295 pages long, uh, phone book size, though, compared to what it was in 1998. And you've seen us on the air with the 1998 comprehensive annual financial report. I tore apart the file room at my office today 
dug through 20 boxes and couldn't find it, but in later shows we will have that. And you can uh, go to the state free of charge and get 99, 98, 97, 96, going back 20 plus years, free of charge. Uh, they will give those to you. But never in the media, never in the press, will you hear about the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, 99s, uh, 2000 isn't out yet, comes out a few months after the fiscal year ends, uh, which is back in October, but it's still not out yet. And they have the Capitol and the nice you know, fireworks going off above it. The year before that, it has the Guadalupe Mountains and cactuses and, you know, pretty shot. No expense is spared. Uh, this Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is not as lavish as the previous Comprehensive Financial Reports, and it does not give all of the numbers. And that is because of the pressure of myself and hundreds of other Americans in the media, in the alternative press, Access TV, syndicated talk radio that is not yet controlled in many cases, uh, reporting on this. You're saying, Alex, you're talking about a comprehensive annual financial report. I'm about to change the channel. Boring taxes. We know government's corrupt. We know they're pulling all kinds of scams on us. What are you talking about? Why should we care about this? Because it's the biggest game in town, folks. This is why your police are now wearing black ski masks. This is why they're getting armored personnel carriers. This is why cameras are going up. This is why they've put up microphones all over Austin, Texas, to little or no fanfare. This is why we're being wired for sound. This is why our driver's license have a digital thumbprint on them. This is why we're losing national sovereignty. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the comprehensive annual financial reports in states, counties, cities, water districts, school districts especially, all have these. And if you type in CAFR, CAFR, or type all the way out, comprehensive annual financial report into a search engine, you will see thousands of links to counties, to cities, to states, and to the federal government bragging, going back over years, stuff going back to probably 1990 is on the web. The federal government has a whole website on this, openly admitting this, this galactic-sized fraud we're about to expose yet again here on the air. Now hold on to your hat, ladies and gentlemen. Strap yourselves in for what I'm about to tell you, and this is 100% proven from the state's own numbers, the county, the city, the feds, you name it. <clears throat> Let me give you an analogy to bring this down to earth. Let's say, hypothetically, I make $100 a week. Alex Jones makes $100 a week, hypothetically. But I tell my family, my wife and children, which I don't have, but again, this hypothetical example, I tell my wife and children that our budget, that we've got to stay on budget, that I only have on budget $2 a week. Now, I talk to my family, they see me doing bills, I put out a report on our finances every month, my wife uh, reads it uh, and uh, looks at it, uh, absolutely amazing. She is thinking that we only have $2 a week to operate on, and I go over in a week, I spend $3, we're a dollar on our budget in a deficit. We're a dollar in the hole. What are we going to do about it? How can we stop this? We're in deep trouble. Honey, you're going to have to get a second job. I'm going to have to get a second job to pay for this. Now, I could have used $1,000 a week and said it was, you know, you know, I told my family that I have, you know, $50. I'm using $100 because it's an easy number to understand. <clears throat> That's what government does. I didn't tell her about the 98. She doesn't know where I'm banking it, where I'm investing it, where I'm blowing it what I'm doing with it. All she knows about is my budget that is $2 a week and that I've gone over and I'm in a deficit. And to pay off that extra dollar a week we're spending because our budget $2 and we spent $3 because she doesn't know about the other $98 that I really made that week, she's going to have to go out and get another job to pay off that debt. This is what the state of Texas, the Travis County, that Austin, Texas does. In 1998, in the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, the state of Texas had a $435 billion surplus. A $435 billion surplus. It was right there on page 8, on page 7, on page 6, just like the 1999 version. 
right there in their own report, ladies and gentlemen. Right there in their own report for the whole world to see. Every major media outlet gets a copy of this. They print up hundreds of thousands of them for the state of Texas. You pay for it. It goes out to all the major bond houses, all the major mutual funds, all the major companies like Xerox and Ford and you name it, Monsanto's. They all get it. <clears throat> this is the stuff that city managers and uh, county managers and the financial directors talk about. This is the stuff they live, the stuff they breathe. They had $435 billion, billion dollars in Texas in surplus. And by surplus, I mean, the Roman Empire had, uh, you know, had a million slaves at one time, but did they have a surplus? No, they always wanted more. Uh, Wino's got two bottles of whiskey, uh, but is that a surplus? No, he always wants more. The point is, th these aren't even surpluses to them. They want more. So back in 98, remember Bush was having the big fight with the Democrats on the surface over the $6.9 billion surplus. We had this huge surplus. Bush was bragging, look how conservative, fiscally conservative we've been. We have this surplus. And there was this big phony fight. And they finally decided to give back Texans $2.2 billion in sales tax cuts. Okay? This is what they did. I mean, folks, this is so simple, it's hard to explain. So they were telling you about a $6.9 billion surplus, extra money, and then had a big fight over where it should be spent or if it should be given back to you, when they really had $435 billion that was profits on investments. And we're going to have Walter Burian on a little bit later. We're going to go into great detail on this. It's one of the biggest secrets around, just like the Federal Reserve, being private and having private stockholders and being run for profit. There are no reserves. You can't audit it. It's just there, printing the money, ordering the Federal Treasury to do so. <coughs> this is the scam. This is the biggest game in town. This is how they're running the whole ball of wax. This is how they're ruling over us. And the big news is, get ready for this, that they own over half the stock market, that is state, county, city, and the federal government, uh, that they own 70-plus percent of Xerox, using an example, 80%-plus of Ford. This is years-old numbers. They own the majority of every publicly traded company of any size. They own almost all of the stock in the Dow Industrial 30, the top 30 stocks. They own most of the NASDAQ. They own a large portion of privately held companies, uh, like Dell, they own a large portion of the stock that Gates hasn't turned loose of in Microsoft, in Intel. Motorola is almost completely owned by the government. This is the definition of organized crime. But yet they sell you at the city level when the city of Austin has billions of dollars, billions of dollars, billions of dollars of surplus. Capital Metro does. They're pulling in billions every year. They tell you, you got to have a tax increase or the schools are going to close. We got to have a tax increase or the potholes won't get filled. We got to have a tax increase or there won't be emergency radios in the fire trucks and EMS, in the ambulances. A patent erroneous lie. Now you understand why government is so called privatizing utilities and privatizing hospitals and privatizing roads and privatizing everything because they already own it all. Any sector they start privatizing means they own over half of it. Like when you hear out in California the big power crunch, whether it's because of privatization, the cities and counties in the state own 80 percent, that was even in the Associated Press today, of those power plants. Now wait a minute, before so-called privatization it was actually privately held predominantly. Up is down, down is up, black is white, white is black. I want you to think about the magnitude of this. Because when they tell you that you've got to pay more taxes because of the deficit on the budget, that's like if I made $100 a week and I told my wife, our budget is $2. And that's all she knew about. She didn't know about the other $98 I'm making a week. 
All she knew about was the $2. We go over that budget of $2, she's going to have to get a second job because she believes that we're in the hole. When in truth, I'm investing and saving or blowing $98 a week and she doesn't even know about it because in the economic world today, everything is budgets. Take the federal government, $34 trillion surplus. You count state and local and water districts and schools in surpluses, that is in liquid cash each year, profit off of investments, profit off of investments, Sixty plus trillion dollars, federal, state, local. <clears throat> because the budget is the money they have coming in to pay the actual services. You'll take a state like New Jersey in 1989. Seventeen billion dollars in bills and services and lighting and power for the government buildings, for the roads, for everything. They made eighty plus billion dollars in profits on investments. So you had sixty plus billion dollars being reinvested. It, it, it's an endless cycle. Within another five years, the government will own all of the stock that you do not privately held, and what the people hold is going to be such incredible peanuts compared to it, it won't even count. Now, how many of you knew that big companies, when they have stockholder meetings, have city managers and portfolio managers and folks from the National Association of Counties and cities and governors there as the top people in that hall with that CEO up there. How many of you knew that, that people from Travis County, top officials, travel the country weekly to New York and Boston and Los Angeles and even here in Austin to go to these stockholder meetings and to see how their stock is doing? How many of you knew that? And here's the really big bombshell. How many of you knew that with the 60 plus trillion dollar surplus that is going on right now with state, federal, and local, that you could have all the government services that are here, expand them according to population, expand them taking inflation into account. You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that we would never have to pay taxes again Never pay taxes again. And that we would get a yearly or monthly, depending on how we wanted it, annuity check in the tens of thousands of dollars yearly. Now, you don't believe that? Alaska does it. Alaska has a system close to what we're talking about. And their people this year got $3,000. And that's just a small bit of what the oil and gas revenue is that the state takes in and the people don't even pay taxes in Alaska. A million people live in Alaska and they're not even paying taxes and they're getting paid by the government. And that's not welfare, folks. That's not, you can't have a man in the house and we're going to break up your family and you got to put your kids on Ritalin and Prozac and then we'll give you enough to barely live in a run-down rat hole that the government operates. We're talking about money coming directly to you. We're talking about never paying taxes again, phasing taxation out in three years. What is the alternative? <clears throat> the alternative is to allow state, local, and federal governments, school districts, water districts like the LCRA, building their giant complexes everywhere, to continue to take your tax money and invest it in the stock market, buy actual companies, start their own businesses. I mean, think about this, and they'll run everything. They already basically do. Think about the magnitude of that. They're telling you you got to dig deep and tighten your belt to pay off the deficit, no, the federal deficit, when the feds have 30 plus trillion dollars in absolute cream off global investments. Forget the bills, things that they're slated they have to pay off in the future. All that's on the budget. They put all the losses, all the expenses on budget, and then tell you about the budget. And never talk about the comprehensive annual financial reports and what their actual cash gross annual receipts are from 
turnpikes and sales taxes and fines and fees and regulatory uh, payments and all of this and port authorities. The list goes on and on. Walter Burian uh, was at the highest levels running a large company in the World Trade Center doing all of this stuff 10 years ago when he found out about it. When he found out, he's going to tell you the story. And I didn't believe Walter Berrien two years ago when I found out about this. He's on the air saying, Texas in 98, let's use your state, Alex. He goes, I'm on the computer right now on the government's own websites. You can all check it out yourself. It was $435 billion. And I'm like, Walter, that's not true. So what happens? Max, who's in the control room right now, goes down. Where'd you go? The, the, the state attorney general's office? And he gets the 98 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. This is the 99. And there it is on page 6, 435, yeah, the comptroller's office, $435 billion surplus. And we're reading in the newspaper every single day. We're seeing it in the paper every day that there was a $6.9 billion surplus and there was a big fight over if we were going to get any of it back, and we got $2 billion back. So we got $2 billion back. They told us it was $6.9 billion surplus when it was really $435 billion. The city of Manhattan. The city of Manhattan, ladies and gentlemen, in 1989, with their own numbers, and I've seen them, had $1.2 trillion in cream surplus off the top. Not the stuff that had to stay in investments, not the paying for the schools or the buildings or leases or fines or fees or new equipment or paying employees. That's all in a little bitty budget over here. Tens of billions of dollars for Manhattan. But trillions of just cream. No wonder the cops are wearing black ski masks. No wonder there's armored personnel carriers driving around. No wonder they're building prisons everywhere. We're basically their slaves, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, trying to inform people we're talking about the biggest game in town with the man that did the equivalent of proving the world was round like Galileo. Uh, it's something so huge, so monolithic, documented by the states, by the counties, by the cities, but no one in the press, no one in the media will talk about it. Governments are running gigantic surpluses. They're buying up everything, most of the industries. We already used the example of Xerox and Ford. It's a total takeover. They're building their own little empires. Uh, I give you Walter Burian, and now a lot of folks are out there copying his work, and that's great. Um, former guy that did all the accounting for the Air Force um, and their investigations uh, in accounting is now out there calling himself Kafferman, Kafferman.com. Uh, a lot of folks are coming forward on this, but this is the person that did it. And he did two hours with me on the radio today, and now he's joining us again for this Access Television show. And I appreciate to Walter Burian doing this. This is the only place you'll see this type of information, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Walter, good to talk to you. Good evening, Alex. Can you hear me? Yeah. Joining us from your home out in Arizona. I want you to take a couple minutes out and just tell folks about Walter Berrien, how Walter Berrien found out about the biggest game in town and uh, who really runs this planet, and, uh, what, and then later solutions to stop it. It's pretty exciting stuff. All right, going back about uh, 10 years ago, I stumbled across the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. I was a commodity trading advisor, one of the first uh, tenants of the World Trade Center back in 1978. Did a national news line coast to coast on commodities. Back in uh, 1990, there was a governor who got elected by the name of Jim Florio in New Jersey. And he got elected on a no-new tax platform. As soon as he got into office, 2.8 billion dollar tax increase, the largest in the state's history. Well, the public was not pleased. And one of the local radio stations, 101.5 FM, two DJs, John and Ken, started doing rabble-rousing, taking calls from listeners on examples of waste and misspending. I was listening on the first two days, and I heard people calling in on examples of 5,000, 15,000. The highest figure I heard was 85,000. And I pulled out the budget report, looked at the billions of dollars that the state was dealing with, called into the radio program, and I said, come on, guys, you're missing the whole point. The state is dealing with billions of dollars. 
If there's fraud, waste, and misspending taking place, it's taking place on the tunes of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And that was using the budget, where they try to give us tunnel vision to just look at the budget. That's what brought you into the comprehensive annual financial report. You started doing a little bit of your own rabble-rousing uh, when John and Ken challenged you, didn't they? Correct. They challenged us to uh, start an organization to repeal the tax increase. Ten of us got together and incorporated a group called Hands Across New Jersey. With the help of John and Ken, rabble-rousing 24 hours a day around the clock, we had our first rally down in Trenton, New Jersey. People converged from all the shore points in New Jersey. We had caravans heading to Trenton. 115,000 people converged on Trenton and shut the city down. But in the interim, I said I better start looking at the revenue budget and finance. Being that I was a commodity trading advisor, large numbers did not bother me. One dollar in a billion, that's just a number. And I started looking at the budget report, and I noticed that all of the cash cow generators of state government, New Jersey Turnpike, Garden State Parkway, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, no revenue shown on the budget report. I didn't see any large return from investment funds on the budget report. And I said, they have to have a two-tier accounting structure here because I'm not seeing the complete picture. Now, the director of the budget, his name was Richard Keevy. He was on vacation until the following Tuesday of that week. I called his lower assistant, and the conversation went just like this. Hi, this is Walter Burian. I'm working on a report for Richard. I have to have it done by Tuesday when he gets back from vacation. I need all the figures on the autonomous agency accounts, interest accounts, investment accounts. And he goes, oh, you want the comprehensive annual financial report. Bing, first time I heard that before. He goes, yeah, can, I, can you send me a copy? He goes, well, I don't know. You better speak to Mark. The next one down from Richard. I called Mark up. Hi, Mark. This is Walter Beery, and I just spoke to Jim. I'm working on a report for Richard. I have to have it done by Tuesday. When he gets back, I need the comprehensive annual financial report sent to me right away. Got it that Friday. Being a bottom-line type person, I wanted to see what the totals were. Now, on liquid assets, investment assets for the state, in the comprehensive annual financial report, it was standing at about $188 billion. Now, I start looking for the total cash gross receipts. The number one question IRS asked in an audit. Found it on page 174 under cash additions, all agencies, all departments, all sources. Here's a state with a declared service budget of $17 billion that was bringing in $86,799,000,000 in cash for the year. I learned the definition of syndicated organized crime right there on the spot and the principle of operation. The principle of operation was anything that was a cost and an expense, they left under the budgetary basis, and the public footed 100% of the bill for 100% of the services. Anything that was a profit center had the ability of being a profit center, large investment fund that generated substantial revenue, totally restricted by statute for no tie or inclusion whatsoever with the budgetary basis. And in New Jersey's case, they were bringing in $69 billion a year over what they were bringing in on the budgetary basis through taxation, fines, and fees. And for the layperson out there, uh, boil that down uh, for them. Uh, the difference between the budget and the real set of books, the comprehensive annual financial reports. Well, up until this point in making this discovery, I always thought, I always heard budget report, budget report, budget. We have a shortfall of budgetary revenue. We have to increase taxes. Our budget is, you know, for the school, for the police. We have to increase taxes. And <clears throat> the budget report is strictly the annual operating cost for that year, what they're bringing in, what they're supposed to be spending. It does not mention the total investments. It doesn't mention the total income, and it doesn't mention the total net worth. Just as yourself, Alex, if you're making $100,000 a year and your budget for operating your house was $30,000 a year, you could audit your $30,000 budget 100 times over, account for a nickel, dime, and penny. If you spent $29,000 this year on your budget, you'd have a $1,000 surplus. If you spent $31,000 on your budget for operating your house, you'd have a $1,000 deficit under your budget. And there's no discussion of the other 70000 Correct, and also no discussion of your $1.5 million net worth that you've been building up over the decades. Never a mention. There are three words that a politician or the news media will not mention. Basic words. 
or expressions. The first one is, what is the total income? Gross receipts. Number two, what are the total investments? Number three, what is the net worth? And uh, there's actually a fourth, which is very important. What is the growth? What has the growth been in five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty-five years? Arizona is a good example. If you look at the 1984 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, the state's service budget is $1.8 billion, and it shows total gross receipts of $2.1 billion, about a $300 million difference. Fifteen years later, going into the year 2000, a service budget reaching $14 billion and total gross receipts of $22 billion. So in the course of 15 years, a 1,000% increase in the revenue taken from the populace. That type of increase is unjustifiable by any means in a free society if it wishes to remain free. And the sound bites are thrown out to the populace, always. We have a shortfall of revenue for our school district. Look, crime, the little old lady's home, whatever. The politicians are using whatever sound bites they can throw out. They keep the public from looking at basic comprehension. What are the total cash gross receipts? All. What are the total investments? What's the total net worth? Never mentioned, never discussed. They always refer to the budgetary basis. As they, excuse my French, laugh their butts off all the way down to the bank every single day. We've allowed the vault door to stay wide open for the last 50 years. And by leaving the vault door open, in fact, with most people saying, uh, vault, what vault? Those sharp little crackers, the ones running this show, okay, on composite government wealth in the upper echelon, you're not dealing with the Joe six-pack crowd betting five bucks on Dallas. These are some of the sharpest crackers on the face of the planet who are quite ruthless, that have worked ex diligently to build their little empires within composite government and by use of the investment funds. And they know exactly what they're doing. They knew that they needed the cooperation of the syndicated media and education. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report was created in 1946. Same year as the United Nations by the same people. Correct. It was a, uh, a plan, an implemented plan to take over the wealth. And it's not a conspiracy. It's right here in Texas for 99 and 98, $435 billion surplus right there in it. Uh, on page six, but they were telling us that we had to increase taxes for the children. My point is, look at all the things they've done. The homes they've stolen, Walter, uh, in the name of property taxes from old people that couldn't pay. Uh, the families that have been wrecked. Do a, do a reality check, well, Alex. People, back, hold please. on. People busting down doors, uh, raiding people's houses who supposedly haven't paid taxes, bank accounts being seized. All of this in the name of we got to run the government, you know, we got a deficit on our budget. Meanwhile, you have this 60 plus trillion dollars a day with state, federal, and local monies. And earlier on the radio today, we talked about how if we took that money, uh, invested it with even a small rate of return of 4 or 5 percent, we could phase out all forced taxation within three years. And that's real math, real numbers. Instead, they're buying up everything, they're taking control. The big question is, Walter, where are they putting? all of this money, the states, the counties, the water districts, the school districts, the feds, where are they investing all this all this so-called surplus money? The, uh, the list is too long to go through. And the, the example of Xerox no Corporation. Looking, no one's seeing, so they have carte blanche to do what they want. The example of Xerox Corporation. Well, I'm going to repeat a conversation I had with a heavyweight from California about two weeks ago. Uh, he, I, I briefed him on the aspect of setting up an annuity pension fund for the resident property owners and taxpayers by, by which the surplus revenues are deposited into this account. Venture and enterprise projects, which the government owns, which no way they should own, like golf courses or real estate venture projects, are sold back into the private sector, and that money is consolidated into the annuity pension fund. And where overgrowth took place, downsizing where appropriate. I gave the ex example of Arizona and their growth. All three areas create a phenomenal amount of revenue. And that annuity pension fund is written in stone, having the, the set principle of operation of supplementing that city or county's budgetary basis until canceled. In other words, you can phase out all forced taxation. 
And in fact, with good prudent financial management, you'll have a surplus occur where you can issue a dividend return back to the resident property owners on top of no taxation. Now, the heavyweight said to me, he goes, Walter, that is perfect. That's what should have been done uh, a long time ago. But it's such a massive structure. How do you ever possibly plan on implementing such a structure? My response to him was, I said, it's already been done. I said, composite government pension funds are standing at $28 trillion. They generated $4.3 trillion last year. Total taxation in this country, federal, $1.8 trillion. Take all local taxation, about $1.6 trillion. You're standing right now at about $3.5 trillion in total forced taxation in the entire country. The government pension funds generated substantially more than all taxation in this country. Through administrative action, you can establish the exact same program for elimination of all taxation in this country and implement it within three years, and in most cases, phase out all forced taxation in this country. Now, Walter, the point I made on the radio today is people are addicted to their poultry uh, little government paychecks to the chicken feed we're given, the money they're using to break up the families, can't have a man in the home. If you don't have a man in the home, we'll pay you. We'll put you in a nice slum. We'll ship in drugs so we can put your sons and daughters in prison. This police state system, people want their chicken feed. They they want it. Even at the current numbers with a $60 trillion surplus with state, local, and federal governments telling us they're actually running deficits when their own documents that they circulate amongst themselves brag that they basically rule the entire country and own almost everything, we have to make the point to people that even if nothing was downsized, even if things were expanded for inflation, that if this money was invested even at a low yield return, we could phase out all forced taxation in three years. Now, if you sold off the golf courses and the hotels and the motels and made the government dump these stocks and the rest of it, then what you would have is enough money, like they do in Alaska. Last year, people in Alaska got $3,000 a piece from the government, a, a, a poultry part of their oil and gas revenues that the state government was getting. Now, I mean, for people who don't understand what we're saying, let me boil it down to you folks one more time. In 1998, now the county, the city, the feds, the water districts, the school districts, countless other government agencies, health care groups, all this stuff, that they're supposedly public, you know, government, they're telling us that they have to increase our taxes because we're running deficits. Then you read their own lavish reports, and all of them put them out, because they trade these amongst themselves uh, in this big empire building. They're all bragging to each other that they've got the biggest empires. Texas does it right here in this year's report from the comptroller. Not a word of the budget in here, folks. It's like me making $100 a week, but I tell my wife I make $2, and I tell her my budget is $2. She never hears about the $98. I spend more than $2. I spend $3. I say, honey, we're over budget a dollar. You're going to have to go get a job. And she goes, you know what? We've got to tighten our belts. We will go get a job. Meanwhile, I'm investing that $98, or I'm saving that $98 every single week, and she never knows anything about it, and I'm taking her money and doing it. Well, we're the woman in the relationship. The government's the mean man here. Uh, they use popular nomenclature, and we're getting screwed. And the same folks that run the Federal Reserve run this system. And it is abominable. Uh, Walter, it's like on the radio today. We had a bunch of callers call in, and they still couldn't get over the fact uh, that we have a deficit. Uh, explain why they hyped that up, the deficit pertaining to the budget compared to the real uh, gross cash receipts the government's bringing in. Do you, you remember the example I gave to you on the phone when we were talking privately of uh, you having two neighbors? Yeah. Can I give that example? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, say for example you have two neighbors, Bob on your right side, Jim on your left side. Bob comes knocking on your door. Alex, <clears throat> lost my job, i got to pay the rent. Can I borrow $500? And you're there. Uh, you're a nice person. You're, okay, here. Jim on your left side Knocks on your door, he goes, hey, Alex, we're going down to the Bahamas this weekend. Uh, drink Mai Tais on the beach. Do you want to come? Uh, we're flying out of my private Cessna. You're there. Sure, let's go. I can squeeze it in. You get back. Bob comes knocking on your uh, door again. Hey, Alex, my wife's in the hospital. She's sick. She needs an operation. I need $2,500 or she's going to die. You're there. Uh, okay, you give him $2,500. 
Jim, on your left side, knocks on your door again. Hey, Alex, we're flying over to Zork for uh, the weekend. Uh, I'm going to have breakfast. Uh, do you want to come? You're there? Sure, I can squeeze it in. Well, you're going to watch Jim on your left side uh, closer than a hawk waiting for uh, what's going to happen next. Bob, you cringe if you think he's going to knock on your door. You don't even want to think about him. Government constantly keeps taking more and more and more, and they have the public cringing. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want anything to do with it. I'll pay my divvy and forget about it until next year. And they kept perpetuating their game over and over again. And the tens of thousands of people involved within the syndicate, and it is a syndicate, a corporate syndicate, sat there smiling and laughing every single day all the way down to the bank. Now remember, folks, this is not speculation. Walter is, we're building a website. There are dozens of other websites of people that have copied Walter's expose, which Walter's actually happy about. So you type in CAFR uh, into the net, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, thousands of links will pop up. 98% of them are government bragging. Here's our CF. Here's our Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. County, cities, water districts, the feds bragging about how they own 70 plus percent of Xerox, how they own most of Ford, how they own most of Dell, how they own most of Coca-Cola. All of these publicly traded companies. It's a sick joke. So when you see that, I wanted to let folks uh, be aware of exactly what that means, uh, so that they'll be able to. Uh, well, right back, back, back when Microsoft was uh, having problems with the court, the uh, head of the uh, New York uh, State Retirement Pension Fund for the state employees came forward saying, we think Microsoft is a good company, and we're not going to sell off our 78 million shares <laughs> of Microsoft. You know, In uh, Texas, I think it was uh, Austin or Houston, the Board of Education uh, last year, uh, or about two years ago, Disney had made an objectionable film. Austin. Austin and the Board of Education said, we're going to divest ourselves of our multi-million dollar holding in Disney. And the public's saying, what are you doing with $40, $35 million in Disney? How much do you have in other stocks? You know, the bottom line is we left the vault door open, and a runaway freight train just started building up more steam, more steam, more momentum, more momentum. And it's a law of physics that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an equal and formidable force to slow it down. And the good point here, Alex, they implemented this program in 1945. It took off steam full force in 1980. And in that time period, you'll see the growth within government probably four, five, six, seven, eight hundred percent in some cases. And they built a phenomenal... All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back live. We've got Walter Burian on the line with us. Um... We're going to recap who Walter Burian is, how he got involved in this, and exactly what we're talking about, and then launch into some case point examples of this biggest game in town. I would suggest that everybody out there tape this show, spread the word. This is real news, one of the top ten stories of the century. We just keep bringing it to you over and over again. Um, to boil it down for you, simply, the government is running gigantic surpluses, but like Walter Burian says, uh, when is there really a surplus? If the Roman Empire had a million slaves, they could always use a million more. The wino's got two bottles of Ripple. It's not a surplus. He wants more. Uh, they can't stop. The state of Texas has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in surplus. Total and complete surplus. This is the 1999 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. In the 1998 one, it clearly shows $435 billion surplus. Also shows numbers around that in the 99 version. Uh, anybody can get this from the comptroller. If they try to refuse, Walter Beard will tell you places where you can. It's free of charge. Everybody should know. Go to the library. They'll have these. But you never hear about it in the press. You never hear about it in the media. You never learned about it in economics in college, did you? You heard about the budget, the budget, the budget. Going back to an analogy. I make $1,000 a week. I tell my wife I'm only making $100 a week. She sees me on the personal computer doing my budget on Quicken, QuickBooks, whatever. I tell her, honey, you're going to have to get a second job. We spent $150 this week. We're $50 over budget. Oh, dear, we'll lose the house. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, we'll lose the new car. Oh, dear, we won't be able to go see, you know, the family at this Christmas back in Chicago. 
Meanwhile, I'm going, because <laughs> I've got 900 extra a week. I'm socking away. And that number goes up. I made a million a week. And I only told you about 100,000. Uh, it'd be the same if I made a billion a week. And I only told you about a couple million of it. It would be the same if I made a trillion a week. And I only told you about a couple billion of it. And we have these huge discussions and media debates. And the, it was in the Statesman a few days ago that Texas Rainy Day Fund only has a few million in it. Eighty-something million. We need tax increases if a recession is coming. It's all about control. When the state of Texas, in their own books, public record, but the media is so controlled, are running gigantic surpluses. The state of Texas, all the 50 states, every county, every city, every water district, school districts, they're all in business, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking to Walter Burian. Walter, now, recap. Uh, what you just said there, I just thought of a, the perfect story from the past. Going back 10 years ago, Jim Florio, when he got elected on his uh, no-new tax platform and then had a $2.8 billion tax increase, he decided to go on a two-week tour of the state every day, stopping at a new location and talking to the public. As the incorporator of Hands Across New Jersey, the largest tax protest group in the state, uh, I managed to get down to his first location. It was uh, Pete's Deli in Hamilton Township. Now, they had arranged for the entire syndicated media to be there. ABC was there, CBS, NBC, CNN, 150 reporters. And I sat down with uh, Jim Florio and his wife at the table to have lunch for 45 minutes. We talked. Every network camera was hovered in over our heads. 150 reporters with uh, handheld recorders going shoved in all around the table. And you were a top security and exchange... Uh... Uh, uh, commodity trading advisor. Yeah, commodity trading, you know, big company up there doing a national deal. Uh, you took the challenge of local talk show host to talk about abuse, found out that the budget isn't one-tenth of the story. Uh, you've had this big rally, 115,000 people downtown. You're starting to learn about this stuff, and you're sitting there talking to the to, to the governor. It's the governor and his wife and myself with every single reporter and every single camera trained on us. And I use this one example. I said, Governor Florio, myself as a financial advisor, if I had a stock issuance and I sold 100% of the stock in my company and I made a $10 million profit this year and I disclosed to my shareholders I made a $1 million profit, number one, that's misrepresentation. Number two, it's fraud. Number three, I, I'd be in jail. I said the state of New Jersey is conducting business as usual, doing the exact same thing, and they've enacted statutes to allow them to do what would be totally illegal for a public corporation to do. Now, I thought he'd try to skate around that a response to that and, and go off in a different area. All the reporters are sitting there up on, on their toes going, ooh, 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 ooh. And Florio's response, I did not believe it. He looked back at me and said, I know. I've been trying to do something about that. They never let him out in public again. They canceled his entire tour, and uh, not one word in the media. Now, I've called around. The media gets the county, the city, the state, the federal. The, the newspaper, the statesman here in town, every year gets a stack of these from around the country. And they have for 25 years. Why would the major networks and the major newspapers, why do they want these? Why do they get these but don't tell us about them? Because they are in 100% partnership with the game. They, I, when, I, when I learned this 10 years ago, that was my question. I was a commodity trading advisor, did a national news line, right in the middle of New York, in the hub of things. I never once heard of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And I said to myself, why did I not hear it on a TV show, the evening news, a talk show? Zilch, nothing. And here is the, the holy grail, the Bible of accounting for government. My first step was I called the mailroom of the Department of Treasury to find out who it was sent to. I found out it was sent to every dean of every college. It was sent to every editor up and down the East Coast. It was sent to the CEO and every one of the directors from ABC, CBS, NBC. Now I'm starting to get mad. I then found out who it was sent to for ABC and NBC. I called their departments, and the conversation went just like this. Hi, this is Walter Beering calling from the Department of Treasury in New Jersey. We've been sending you our comprehensive annual financial report for the last 14 <coughs> years. How many other states are sending you their report? 
and uh, ABC was getting it from 38 states. NBC was getting it for 30 from 36 states. Now I'm getting mad. I'm starting to see a cooperative effort for non-disclosure. I then asked myself the next logical question. How much is the syndicated media making from composite government sources? You know, up front you would think of, uh, you know, federal grants, uh, you know, public education uh, grants for media broadcasting, uh, you know, service commercials, city, county, state, federal. Uh, that was a substantial portion of the uh, syndicated media's income. But then, realizing that composite government funds own the primary shares of major Fortune 500 companies, such as Xerox, over uh, 78%, Motorola in the 60s, uh, IBM, AT&T. They own that stock, and through the proxy votes, through the investment managers, they can exercise demands over those corporations on who to use on the marketing campaigns and the advertising. So they can direct more money to the syndicated media. And this is why when we watch ABC, CBS, NBC, they have the same story with the same talking head looking the same, with the same advertisers in the exact same order every night because they give us three different brands of the same slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not speculation. I have in my hot little hands the comprehensive annual financial report for Texas for 1999. Now, Walter, you, uh, almost a year ago, when we first talked on live on the radio, <clears throat> and you've talked about 40 million people since you got in your disclosure, I'm going to go through all of that, <clears throat> you know, bringing all this forward. You said get comprehensive annual financial reports from 98 and before because you said that now, because of your disclosure, they are starting to even try to water those down. And uh, my 98 one clearly says $435 billion surplus. That is just the cream off the profits of their investments, not even all their investments. And now it's only got 60 something billion. Now, I went and checked out what you said. You said it a year ago. You said it today on the radio. You said that the 99 reports that were coming out. Take a look at 96. Well, th the point is. They're on to what you're doing. They're on to the fact that you're on to them and people are waking up. What? How are they manipulating the reports? I mean, they say we have a little surplus now in Texas, $4 billion. They said it was uh, 6.9 back in 98. But still, it's, you know, 60-something. Look, look at 96's report, and you'll see they listed the transactions they handled for local government. Well, that's my point. This book has gotten smaller. This book isn't as lavish, and you've been talking about that. How are they manipulating the conference of annual financial reports because the news is starting to get out? How are they now cooking these when books, I too? When I came up with disclosure, originally, 99 and prior, it was required to show all investment revenue, all income coming in from all sources in the combined financial columns. As of 99, they changed it to showing all investments Revenue, all income, all you know, all revenue coming in necessary to meet obligations. There's a big difference. So that's like saying again, back to a budgetary manipulation. I need five hundred dollars a week to run my household, so I make my budget uh, five hundred, and have everybody focus on the five hundred dollars when I'm really making two thousand a week, hypothetically, and. Then people get wise. My wife gets wise, and I'm really making all these thousands of dollars I'm not telling her about. So I go, it's all right, honey. Here are those books. See? And then I only show her enough of the money, enough of the surplus, to say, oh, I just had this in reserve in case I needed it. I'll give you a key, I'll give you a key example from 10 years ago. As I mentioned, education is included in this game. Now, in the New Jersey's Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, it showed consolidation of the state universities and colleges under one financial column. I noticed right off the bat they had $8.5 billion in liquid investment funds. It showed that they made a $1.1 billion profit on their investment funds Okay, for the year, bringing up their total to $9.6 billion. Are you with me? Yes. My next question in logical progression was, I wonder what the total tuitions are paid by all students attending college and universities in New Jersey. That was listed also, $644 million. 
So right off the bat, I said to myself, they made $1.1 billion profit on their investment funds. The total tuition base for all students was uh, $644 million. I said the, the kids could have gone to school for free for the year and gotten paid to go to college. Now, what actually happened that year was they cited a shortfall of budgetary revenue and had a 7% tuition increase. This is back in 1989. Now, that's just with a university running a scam. Let's talk about some of the smaller examples. You used a case in a small county uh, where you live in Arizona now. Give us, tell us about that. An example regarding... Uh, the health care. Oh, that was in uh, Tucson, Arizona, Pima County. A couple years back, the health care program, citing a shortfall of operating funds, said that they're going to have to cut back on services and turn away people, unless they had a $6 million tax increase. They were supposedly $6 million short. So they presented to the public for a $6 million tax increase. Now, you know, they forgot to mention they were short $6 million for the year, and the $6 million would be every year thereafter. But the public, saying we can't turn away the sick and the elderly, voted on the $6 million tax increase. Well, a federal auditor, retired of 30 years, he looked at the health care program's financial statement. He called me back immediately and said, Walter, they invested in one shot $35 million in the local government investment pool. By investing $35 million in the local government investment pool, that's what created the $6 million shortfall in their operating funds. If they had not invested $35 million with the local government investment pool, they would have had a $29 million surplus for the year. So, again, the classic thing we hear on the local news in Austin, got to have a massive, you know, $300 million tax increase or bond proposal for the schools or they'll be shut down. Got to spend all the tax money for Capital Metro, a few hundred million extra year or that'll be shut down. Uh, we got to spend a few extra hundred million or there won't be potholes getting filled and emergency radios in the ambulances and fire trucks. This is the same thing all over the country. I've seen the stories. The people go, you know, I, I'm paying a lot of taxes. I'm, I'm in the hole. I may have to sell my bass boat. I may have to get into the college tuition because all these property taxes and sales taxes and all these other fines and fees. But damn it, we'll do it for the kids, for the old people, you know, for the education, for the potholes when they had money to pave the streets literally in gold. And they laughed all the way down to the bank. And they laughed all the way down to the bank. So boiling it down for the simple minds out there, and I'm not being sardonic, I'm not being uh, patronizing to you, uh, condescending, but I have to be honest with some of the viewers. They're going, well, we got a huge deficit. Federal government's got a four, a five trillion, five hundred billion dollar deficit. I heard it on the news. Walter, the numbers I've crunched from the government's own sites on the comprehensive annual financial report. Anybody can go there on the web. Federal government. They don't hide this stuff. They just know the media won't cover it, so you won't listen out there. They've got this 30 plus trillion dollar cream at the top. 30 plus trillion dollar cream. Uh, just with the federal government, you know, the states and the counties and the cities have more. Uh, I mean, this racket is everywhere. You, you talk about Pima County in Tucson, that was just with a hospital fund from the city where they spend, you know, invest is 30 plus million, so they have a budgetary shortfall of 6 million. Don't tell you about that. With the federal government, I mean, we hear all the time, well, we have this deficit, so we got to tighten our belts. We have to have a tax increase. We can't even have a tax cut. Um, that's really what's driving this fraud is people thinking we're in financial trouble when there's really giant surpluses. What's driving the fraud is the easy ability to build phenomenal empires just by structuring it and implementing it with the public sitting there saying, is there something going on? Not having the foggiest clue. And being that the public left the vault door open for the last 45, 50 years, phenomenal empires have been built, large and small. Well, I want to explain something that we closed the radio program today with. <clears throat> We've got plenty of time now you're going to be with us for probably another 40 minutes or so as we tape this program but the point I wanted to make here is Walter uh, I didn't believe you two years ago I went and I checked this stuff out uh, you're a conservative guy you're in there about the numbers the facts you know financial planner um, commodity trading advisor 
yeah, commodity trading advisor, you're sitting there looking at this. It's so big. It's it, it's like an elephant in the living room. It's hard to even discuss. It's like the simplest things. A lot of people can't even grasp it. But you said it. And, and you know, it's funny. I'll have the CEO of Taurus Firearms on, the fourth largest gun manufacturer, and he'll say, I'll say, uh, Mr. Mortison, are you aware that the United Nations is taking over the gun manufacturers and that this U.N., uh, that this attack on the Second Amendment is from the U.N.? He goes, yes, I've been in State Department meetings. I thought he would laugh at me. This is a major CEO of a $100 million, billion dollar company. He says, Alex, he says, he says, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, he said, they're coming in, and the, I've been at tables with the U.N. at the State Department, with other CEOs, and they say, we're shutting down the gun manufacturers. Either you join us and sell out to us, or your business is gone. It's all over for you. Andrew Cuomo of HUD threatening him threatening all these other CEOs. He said it was organized crime. He said he thought he was in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about how in 1946, 1945, same year the UN is set up in this country. This country runs the New World Order. It's not coming after us. We are it. We're the slaves right inside Rome. That they set up the 1313 patch out of Chicago, same year as they set up the UN, to formalize and standardize the National Association of Counties the National Association of Cities, the National Association of Governors. And in 46, they created the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And then they created the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. So it looks normal. It looks standard. Hey, everybody's doing it. And then they go in and buy up all the corporations with our tax money and build their own empires and control it. Uh... You know, you have the communism and the socialism publicly being funded by the Rockefellers to consolidate power overseas where they couldn't take people down, where monarchies wouldn't play ball with them. I mean, it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, and now it's all, now it's all coming together. It's all coming down. You talked about how you crunched the numbers of the states with the highest tax rates, the biggest governments, the biggest surpluses with gun laws. Tell the, tell the viewers about that. About four years ago, I did a little chart comparison. I uh, looked at uh, states with the uh, least uh, stringent gun laws, uh, and I looked at the states with the most oppressive gun laws, and made a chart. Least at one end, most oppressive on the other end. I then looked at the states with the most taxes, fines, and fees levied per populace, and the state with the least taxes, fines, and fees levied. Put them in order, made a chart. Well, guess what? You put the charts back to back, an exact parallel. The more taxes, fines, and fees extorted from the uh, populace, the most oppressive gun laws possible. The least amount of taxes, fines, and fees extorted from the populace in a state, the, the most lax on the gun laws. Exact parallel. Elaborate on that. Well, if you go into uh, a state where, like Vermont or... Uh, uh, Montana, uh, very uh, low taxation, uh, least oppressive, even though they're catching up with everybody else. They had very lax gun laws. We go into a state like New Jersey where the public is being extorted from any which angle and shape and form from all areas of government, city, county, and state, and the police and the judicial, maximum fines. You have the most stringent gun laws possible in this country. So it's simple. With financial slavery, with total governmental slash private fraud in basic fascist collusion, with this type of development, you're going to have a disarmed population. Hence, Hitler was for gun control. Stalin was for gun control. Mao, they disarmed the slaves. Hence, the United Nations is for gun control because it was founded by the very banking interests that now run this nation, that run this world, Openly funded by them, the same people that set up Patch 1313 in Chicago to start the National Association of Counties, the National Association of Cities, of Governors, of Mayors, of County Commissioners, to standardize the policies. And here's a very dangerous point, Alex, being that they have already accomplished control and ownership of the wealth of this country from the public. The public now becomes a liability. So it is in their interest right now to eliminate a good chunk of the public. 
Um, because they now own the wealth. They control the wealth of this country. I was on some of the financial sites, uh, Morgan Stanley, Dean Wetter, and others, this weekend doing research on that. And they have composite indexes on there what the fastest growing part of the economy is. Until a month and a half ago, it was still tech stocks, the Internet. Uh, number two had always been prison industry. Walter, it's now number one. They're building prisons everywhere. Uh, yeah. They're militarizing the police. This if you look at the prison industry and the court system, it is the most profitable corporation in this country. The court system and the prison system generates more money than 10 of the largest Fortune 500 companies in this country. Put together. And, and that's a, another public number. I mean, folks, the fact is they have convinced you that the government's in trouble, the state, the local, the water district, they need more money, they need more regulations, they need more taxes because they're bankrupt. When in truth, they own 78% of Xerox, 60% of Motorola, every major traded company, all of the Dow 30, you've looked at the Dow 30, what percentage of the Dow 30 uh, in the aggregate uh, do state uh, and city and federal agencies own? You're talking, if you look on an individual basis, stock by stock, composite government wealth right now is the market. We're talking probably about an excess of 70% uh, of the ownership is controlled by composite government funds. The public and, is insignificant in the marketplace. And you look, yeah, and, and to use a case point example, the city of Manhattan, uh, you've got those numbers there. I know you did uh, today on the radio, and I, after the show, went and actually checked it out. It's right there. They brag about this. In 1989 or 1990, you looked at Manhattan, not just states with hundreds of billions. What did Manhattan have, the city well, of Manhattan? Well, my progression after looking at the state of New Jersey, I looked at the state of New York, and the state of New York had approximately $535 billion. And then I got the city of Manhattan's report, which covered the uh, boroughs, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and so forth. They had $1.2 trillion, more than the entire state had on their books. And that's in cream. That's in private investments. And also, a couple of years later, Manhattan was crying poverty and it had a tax increase. And then you, got you look to at get the bailed out by the feds, supposedly. And you look at the so-called. Uh, let's use another example for folks. Let's throw it all in their face. Orange County. Orange County. You had a couple of slap happy investment managers who were uh, playing around with derivatives and got their fingers burnt. They lost 1.3 billion dollars of the uh, money. Well, a county just with derivatives, the most speculatory, dangerous thing in the market, just $1.3 billion, just a county. The no. derivative market, as said by Alex Greenspan uh, several months back, uh, he said he was concerned being that the derivative market was up to $80 trillion. And the government is the primary player in the derivative market. But Orange County attracted all of this attention. Now, one person happened to stumble across Orange County's comprehensive annual financial report. And he looked and he saw that they had $16 billion in profitable investments. They were only talking about their losing transaction. But but it, it it they couldn't control the media on that. It was out for a while that they lost $1.3 in a very speculative area of the market. But they had to have a tax increase and almost went bankrupt. So the people had to pay more, almost like that was done on purpose, when they really had tens of billions of extra that was profitable in the market. There's an economist by the name, and he owns a bank, Anthony Hargis, out in California. He looks at comprehensive annual finance reports, determines that local government's cash position, and determines how long could they operate existing from their existing cash without charging one nickel in taxes, fines, or fees. Now, in Orange County's case, when they were crying bankruptcy, they could have gone on for another 11.9 years performing the exact same services without taxing one nickel before they ran out of cash. And that's not taking into account if they invested the tens of billions of surplus dollars in that one county and then took uh, the surplus of that and reinvested it. And if they didn't do that, they could have taken it and paid dividends, that's checks, to the uh, property owners. Well, the bottom line to cut to the chase is if the public at this point in time unifies with basic comprehension, if you capture 10% of the population with basic comprehension. You can administratively restructure government at this point in time 
to phase out all forced taxation in this country. Well, Walter, I want to stop you. I want to get to that a little bit later, because for people that have just joined us, the audience gets much larger as the show progresses over two and a half hours. I want to recap who you are, what we're talking about, what's happening, and why this is so important. Folks, I know when you hear about budget or money or taxes, you tune out, you're sick of it. It's been designed that way. You think government is bankrupt, in trouble. In truth, they are the most opulently rich and controlling class around. They are merged with private industry, and that's why the mainstream media won't even begin to talk about it. I want to briefly recap, Walter, exactly what we're dealing with here, and then I want to talk about the amazing solutions that uh, you and others have and that will actually work. Well, the bottom line is your listeners now know why Gorbachev went Democratic. <laughs> People think they're free and put a lot more weight on their back. More money, more control. And you talked about, if the American people were a gerbil, what are we doing right now? I always used to give the expression, uh, the way the uh, system works is they keep the chipmunk running on the tread treadmill, chasing the carrot. As through trickle-down economics, they provide just enough revenue to, to keep the chipmunk running at optimum proficiency as they tap off 80% of the energy produced. And... Uh... I also had my own little analogy, and I think I'm going to uh, put an editorial on the website or maybe make T-shirts up of it, <clears throat> talking about the mass of government, how big it is, what it controls, 70% of the market, 70% of the companies. Um, not well, to Alex, just one quick notation. I noticed 45% of the revenue is invested internationally. They get their, some of their best rates of return on the international companies. I went shopping for Christmas. Every item I picked up said, made in China. You now know the reason for NAFTA, GATS, the whole nine yards. The government funds are investing with the international corporations, producing the product at 10 cents on the dollar and selling it back at 40 cents on the dollar here in the States, accentuating their profits. And we're talking about water districts, counties, cities, the states, the feds, Texas, with a $435 billion surplus every year that keeps getting invested into the trillions. Uh, and they're telling you that they're broke, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Walter, talk about how China and its billion and a quarter slaves fits into all of this. China? You were talking about the investments over there through the companies owned by the government. I'm breaking down. Just saw the, um, the composite government funds in their notes section. They usually authorize about 10% of the revenue invested with a group called the Asian Development Authority and 10% of the revenue invested with the African Development Authority. And if you look at a comprehensive annual financial report, especially on one of the investment pools or one of the large government pension funds, it breaks down exactly where the money is invested, who's holding what, and the dollar amount. Everyone should get a copy of their state retirement fund for the uh, state employees it breaks down where the money is invested. And they'll see the majority in international uh, stocks versus U.S. stocks at this point in time. The growth factor is more for international. In fact, uh, a lot of retirees and folks out there saying, hey, leave it alone. The system may be corrupt, but it's my pension. Explain that you have giant surpluses out of the pensions that are being invested that they'll never see. Arizona. The uh, total actuarial liability for all state retirees and participants in the plan for being 100% funded, all active employees and retired, required $14.5 billion. The current fund balance is verging on over in excess of $32 billion. The employees will never see that money and uh, never benefit from it. The Arizona legislature a couple of years ago, being that the employers, the cities, the counties, the school districts, and the employees were contributing to something where no way they should be contributing one dime, and in fact they should have been getting substantial refunds back. They passed their own internal statutes to make the pension fund strictly participatory, where it requiring a minimum of a 2.18% contribution from the employee and the employer. So the government employees are getting shafted in many cases also. So recapping, Walter, again, using the example of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for, uh, give me a close shot, guys. Thanks. I want to say the crew's doing a great job. Uh, 
for 1999, and then you look at 1998, $435 billion surplus. Karen Keaton Rylanders, Carol Keaton Rylanders' own report uh, right here, and you count all the counties. What is it, 100 of them in Texas? Get your hands on 1996. In the notes section, it shows the transaction the state government made for local governments. They show $1.8 trillion in transactions for local government. And that's nationwide. No, that was the state of Texas. State of Texas. One point eight trillion. Why? I've got government. some of the past years. This is the last one that's out. Ninety nine. Why are the reports getting smaller and smaller now that you've been exposing them? And how do we get that other information that they're now cutting out of them? You have to look at a prior year's comprehensive annual finance report and see where certain areas all of a sudden get clipped or disappear in their entirety, and then you have a a lead list to say what happened to these funds, where can I see the accounting? And that's all because a successful uh, commodities trader uh, and financial advisor in New Jersey uh, found out that the whole thing is a giant stinking fraud 10 years ago and started talking about it three years ago and made a documentary film and has done hundreds of radio interviews. Now, suddenly, I remember years ago, Walter, you could call and get one of these pretty quick. Sometimes they'll give the, the, the runaround. Uh, you have had a massive effect on others by talking about this ad. We need to keep pushing viewers. We're talking about budgets. We're talking about comprehensive annual financial reports. You're saying boring. Walter, recapping before we talk about the solutions. For people that have just joined us, explain the difference between budget, 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 and how that's drilled into our head, and the comprehensive annual financial report. Well, the, the, be the beautiful point Explain the fraud to people why this is the biggest game in town. The beautiful point here is that being that the uh, government for the last, uh, since 1945, created this structure to take over the wealth, and they were successful. They have done it. So we're talking $60 trillion in composite liquid investment wealth held by federal and local governments. That's a phenomenal increase in 30 years. Now, on the composite government pension funds, they generated $4.3 trillion last year. Total taxation in this country in 1999 was approximately $3.6 trillion, federal and local governments. So composite government pension funds generated substantially over total forced taxation in this country. Now, can anyone see, with simple administrative action, restructuring composite government through consolidation of the surpluses into an annuity pension fund set up for the resident property owners and taxpayers, sale of venture and enterprise projects, which government now owns, but they shouldn't, like golf courses, amusement parks, real estate ventures. Hotels. Sell it back to the private sector where it belongs. That generates a phenomenal amount of revenue for consolidation and into the annuity pension fund. And where overgrowth took place, downsizing, because they're collecting the money to pay for that excessive growth. So with downsizing, that revenue becomes available for allocation into the annuity pension fund set up for the resident property. Yeah, we're about to get to that. The, the solution is... $60 trillion in investments and cream and private that just keeps rolling. They've got 70% of the stock market. That is governments, state, local, federal. They're militarizing the police against us, treating us like slaves, squeezing us, saying they need more when they basically already own everything. Um, even your mortgage is predominantly owned by government interest. I, li I like to use one example, Alex, which is very simple and very basic, but 100% true. If every one of your listeners had a, an 11 and 12 year old boy, and they gave him carte blanche to write their own allowance check each week, and you made $1,200 a week, within no time they'd be cutting a check for $1,000 a week. And if you told them you're going to cut them back to $800 a week, they'd kick, they'd scream, they'd holler, they'd use any logic available to them to justify how a 12, an 11 and 12 year old boy could not survive on $800 a week. There is no difference here whatsoever. You just have bigger ploy, uh, boys and sharper players. But recapping for those that are just joining us, the, and I know you've gone over this a thousand times, Walter, the difference between the budget that we always hear about in the press and this big secret, the comprehensive annual financial report that all the media and everybody else in the corporations know full well about because the government is their owners. Well, the bottom line is the budget is strictly the annual operating expenses, what they're going to uh, spend for the year and what they're going to bring in for the year. So all of the losses are there? The expenses for uh, operating government. 
and what they're going to tally and tax the public to perform these functions. And people think that the that the budget is the whole financial universe of government and private industry, but in truth, it is the comprehensive annual financial report. Isn't the second set of books? It is the books. Correct. The comprehensive annual financial report will show the budget. They call it the general purpose fund, and it'll show everything else: all other income, the investments that have built up over decades and decades, the net worth of that government. You know, if you lost your job today, Alex, okay, how are you going to pay for your budget for your house? Well, I'd have to work for another radio network. No, you couldn't get a job. You were disabled. If you had an investment fund, say, built up over the last 20 years, equal to a million dollars. Well, see, I'm not like the government and these private corporations that work together. I, I, I'm not out there with cops squeezing people for money and taxing the daylights out of folks and all of this. I don't have any money. I did, I did a little uh, logistical s survey, uh, even in my own hometown here in Prescott. I looked at taxes, fines, and fees levied against the uh, public in traffic fines via population 20 years ago versus today, 600% increase per population. It's a revenue-generating venture. I mean, if you could pull people over and uh, clip them for $100 uh, any day of the week, you'd become a millionaire overnight, correct, Alex? Yeah. And you, you hire the cop. And Well, hold on. You hire the cop. You Now they're only hiring cops with low IQs. That's even been in the news. You hire a cop that'll go out, you pay 30-something grand a year, he generates you a million, uh, and you just expand and hire more cops. You got the people begging for more cops for some reason when we got more than we ever needed. The number of cops has doubled in the last eight years. The number of prisons has doubled. The prison population has doubled. People are still begging for more, begging for more, begging for more. Government owns everything. They're expanding. I go back to, you now know why Gorbachev went Democratic. Talking about these empires, these water districts, these city councils, these county commissioners, how do the politicians and the minions running these little empires, how do they themselves profit out of this scam? I'll give you an example from uh, Arizona, Yavapai County. There was a border supervisor, a guy by the name of Feldmeyer, came into office about uh, nine years ago with a disclosed net worth of about $85,000. He's currently up to uh, over uh, $8 million ten years later. He made most of his money on land transactions. His latest venture, he bought about 1,600 acres in Prescott Valley. After he buys the property, it was a ranch land uh, with one access road on one side, another access road on the other side, but nothing connecting. And uh, one year later, the most beautiful access road goes right through the property. Now, the uh, county fairgrounds and racetrack, which was built 100 years ago, which uh, was too small to handle the, uh, the need for services, they had to move. Guess where they're going to move? Right next door to uh, his property. Guess what's going up on his property? To the new golf course and condominium complex. Where's the money coming from? The county bank, run by the boys. They'll pull out five to seven million dollars on that venture alone. And that's just one little county out of hundreds of counties in this country. And there were a lot of people complaining about him, so there were two groups that started a recall petition against him. And they were the regular you know, public uh, tax protest groups, and they were slowly getting signatures for a recall. He gets his best friends to start a third recall petition against himself. They immediately get all the signatures required, being that they're well-networked, and uh, complete the signature requirement. And then they go to the Superior Court judge, his best friend. I'm an elected official. I can't have three recall petitions against me at the same time. You're going to have to invalidate two of them. Guess which two they invalidated? The citizens recall petition. The third one started off by his friends. Guess what happened to that? Got dropped. Dropped, correct. The game is absolute, and we're talking millions of dollars. It's not the Joe's six-pack crowd betting $5 on the football game who's going to win on Dallas. These guys have worked hard to build their little empires. You know, if you went to a cocaine dealer and said, uh, I heard you were doing $5 million of cocaine this year. Is that true? Oh, you're crazy. I've never even touched this stuff. I don't even know what it looks like. You know? They're going to perpetuate their game. There's a lot of money involved here. And you talked about how using the Orange County debacle, the feds have now streamlined and make the counties and cities and school districts and water districts 
funnel their money through their gates. How does that feed into this? Well, the largest investment pool was pension funds. And back in uh, 1981, the uh, Fed sent out a transmittal letter to the uh, local governments. By the way, there's 85,000 separate corporations in local government. They uh, sent out a transmittal letter saying, you and local government uh, have very odd and peculiar rules regarding the management of your pension funds, which would keep you restrictive from using uh, such trading vehicles such as derivatives, options, advanced forward currency transactions, uh, puts, calls. This costs you billions of dollars each year. Uh, CalPERS, which did very well for uh, the California pension funds, uh, have reorganized under a national program, which we recommend you participate with. Under this program, you will not be restricted to not using derivatives, futures, calls, puts, and options, and thus you can benefit. So in 1981, they created the Mega Market Makers accounts through consolidation of the government pension funds. If you look at the exponential growth in the Dow from 1981 forward, you now know why. Composite government was securing their open interest and takeover of the marketplace. And now they're working on the international marketplace. How does the United Nations fit into that, this with the desertification treaty that the Republicans accidentally passed after Clinton signed it? They didn't mean to give the United Nations 70 percent. Uh, let's, let's go back. Well, 19... they gave them 70 percent of the control over 70 percent of the land in our country, 100 percent of it. That's public record now, folks. October 18, 2000, passed. I thought it was bad four years ago, the U.N. taking over the national parks and monuments. Uh, how does the United Nations fit into this? But the same big 19... bankers, the same big bankers that set up the UN, are now giving it control over our country. Why is that happening? Let's go back to 1945. There was one, two pesky little documents that existed in the United States which protected the populace. We had the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. This kept uh, the uh, power mongers from having absolute control over the people. Well, let's create the United Nations, 1945. Corporate headquarters, New York. Let's pay 65% of the dues for all of the member nations so they, they will participate so we can give some kind of validity to this organization. We don't care if we give them an, uh, a loan and they default on it after they pay their dues. The IMF will pick up the tab. So here we have the United States boys creating the UN. Now they are giving authority to the UN for judicial, administrative, uh, military authority, property, because the U.N. is not subject to those two pesky little problems, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Thus, the boys controlling the show now have a vehicle they can use, the U.N., to control the populace of the United States that is exempt from constitutional law and the Bill of Rights. And on the screen, we're going to put up Infowars.com that has the Desertification Treaty and other details and links directly to Congress. Uh, at Infowars.com uh, for folks to check that out. And I am building a site with Walter Burian's information on Infowars.com about the comprehensive annual financial reports, and that will be up uh, sometime next week. Uh, and if you just type in C-A-F-R, CAFR, on into a search engine, you'll get thousands of links to government websites bragging about how much money they have and how much stocks and bonds and how many companies uh, they own. It is empire-building. Keep in uh, mind, keep in mind, Alex, they have perpetuated this empire and they are growing unabated. They have accomplished their objective, the complete financial takeover of the wealth of this country. All right, re recapping. continues to fund it. Recapping, Walter, microcosm, there's counties, cities, states, the feds, cappers. They only tell us about the budget in Texas. Oh, we had a $4 billion surplus in 99. We had a $6.9 billion surplus in uh 98. We have this big phony political fight between the Republicans and the Democrats, the same people at the top, the same committee people, uh, fighting over how much of that. Six hold on, hold on. Dollar surplus going into the year 2004. Yeah, fighting over how much of a surplus we'll have, how much they'll give us back in tax cuts. When really in 98 they had 435 billion. The point is they don't need more money. They don't need more taxes. Taxes could be completely phased out. Now Walter Burian, give us the solutions of how this problem could be fixed here in the next 10 minutes. Well, as I mentioned, I talked to a uh, heavyweight in California and briefed him on the proposal of setting up an annuity pension fund for the resident property owners and taxpayers on a city level, county level, and state level, whereby the surplus revenues are deposited into the venture and enterprise projects, which no way government should be owning, 
are sold back into the private sector, golf courses, uh, the whole nine yards, phenomenal assets, which they should not be owning, and where overgrowth took place, downsizing. I gave the example of Arizona, 1,000% increase in 15 years in revenue taken. With those three areas, you create a phenomenal investment pool of funds under this annuity pension fund for the resident property owners and taxpayers. It is written in stone that the principle of operation of this fund, and you have, you get together with a few financial planners and some of the top investment banking groups to write a prospectus for that city, county, or state, having a guideline for phasing out all forced taxation and having the local government operate from that fund, okay? You have the ability of phasing out all taxation in that city, county, or state and under good prudent financial management, providing a surplus there whereby the local residents and property owners get a dividend return on top of no forced taxation. It can be done all across the country. What is required at this time is to get a model up on the playing field. Target one city, one county. County would be better because if you pass it on the county level, Every city within that county becomes subject to following the principle of operation of the restructuring under the authority of the will of the public. Now, Walter, and he said, this is a massive structure, Walter. How can you possibly implement it? It would take so much time. And my response was, it's already been done. Can now, Walter. The government pension funds generated $4.3 last year. That's more than all forced taxation in the country. Now, Walter, before we get back into the solution, I want to remind people uh, of the fact that not everyone in government is even aware of this. In a county, in a city at the lower level, who are the players that have to be aware of the full nature of the constructive fraud of this organized crime syndicate? Your city manager is going to be aware. Uh, the uh, treasurer of a state will be aware. The auditor general of the state will be aware. The investment banking groups, they're quite aware of the, the resources. They're constantly bidding to get the money to manage. The, uh, the best place to look is the Auditor General's office. He gets copies of every single report submitted by local government. So if the city of Austin is refusing to give locals a copy of their comprehensive annual financial report saying, huh, what is that? I, I don't know what that is. I never heard of those. Yeah, you can call the Auditor General's office and they'll say, well, uh, I'll use an example of making up a name here, but uh, Jim Miller produces this for the uh, CPA firm of uh, Smith, Smith & Barney. And... Uh, their address is, and their telephone number is, and uh, they've prepared the report for the city of Austin for the last five years. And, and I don't know exactly who prepares it, where to get a copy, and when you go back to your city and they uh, play dumb, uh, you know. Being that you said that, a year and a half ago, I got a call from someone in Pennsylvania. They said, I just spoke to my congressman. I'm good friends with him, and he never heard of this before, but he's going to look into it. And he said he will definitely take some action on this issue as soon as he uh, finds out about it. And, you know, I kind of smiled. And I said, I'm going to put you through on a conference call. I called the uh, mailroom from uh, the Department of Treasury in uh, Pennsylvania that put out the report. And uh, I just basically said, uh, you know, con this congressman, uh, he, it was like about a four or five term congressman. How long has he been getting the report? Well, he's been had it sent to him for the last eight years. Where did you send it to? We sent it to his office, uh, except for two years ago. He was on vacation in the Bahamas, and we sent the report to him in the Bahamas because he wanted to get it while he was on vacation. So here is the congressman saying to his constituent, I never heard of that before. I'm going to have to look into it. And here I confirm to the person that the person has been getting it for eight years, and in fact, specially requested the report to be sent to them in the Bahamas. Now, we're about to get back into the solution. For those that don't know what we're talking about, the budget is one small little thing. What government spends in the services, whether it's checkpoints or stealing your children or cramming Ritalin down their throats or actually paving a road like they're supposed to do. And they say, if you don't give us all your money, you're not going to have the roads paved because we're broke. When in truth, here in Texas in 98, $435 billion cream surplus after everything they'd spent just sitting there. And Alex, and when, they, when they cry poverty saying the road has to be improved, we're going to have to have a bond issuance of $150 million to pave this road. And I always thought the public was funding that $150 million. When I started looking at the revenue flow, they're using their own investment funds to fund their own bond issuances, locking the public in under more debts. Now, Walter, getting back into solutions, if we had people that could take over a county, 
and let's say a smaller county that only had, you know, 200 million, 100 million in surplus and in investments. Um, how would it work? How would people do it? I mean, if you walked around and gave out prospectuses and showed folks, hey, this is the county's real surplus. Let's vote in good people. Let's get those fraudulent voting machines out of there with our county clerk here in Austin who's been caught several times doing it, and Eddie Dubois. Let's get control of the county. How do you, because the people need to know this is what, real. What, 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 They're what, what, taking what, the money. What? They're taking the money for themselves. How do we get the forced taxation phased out and get dividends, checks every month sent to the people with this tens of trillions of dollars they have in surplus? Let's use a county that has $100 million in surpluses. They have approximately uh, $300 million in venture and enterprise projects, which can be sold back into the private sector. Okay, now we're standing with $400 million. Deposit government pension funds, uh, Washington did 23% last year, Oregon 22%. We're talking on about $50, $60 billion. So let's say a nice average rate of return of 15%, conservative figure. Okay? Half of what they're, close to half of what they're really getting. That's $60 million a year on $400 million. Now say, for example, the counties. Operating budget right now is $55 million. Okay? And you're generating $60 million. You just satisfied the entire budgetary requirements, which means you can phase out all forced taxation, and there's a $5 million surplus. That you divide among the 120,000 people that live in the county. Correct. And uh, as the uh, fund grows, say, for example, you're coming up with a surplus, you keep a certain amount of your surplus to let it grow. And... You can actually get a quite a nice little dividend check back if you have prudent financial management within that local government and perform all of the normal functions of government. Forever with conservative investments. And we're standing at a crossroad, Alex. We have a runaway freight train, and if it continues on its current course, we're standing facing a thousand years of subservancy and subjugation. A thousand years. Yeah, these empires are militarizing, building prisons, county cities, the feds here in Austin, the states. They just built a $93 million justice center. You can't get into it. They, the, the, the stairs aren't for your use. There's one elevator, lines of people, cops with submachine guns, black uniforms, combat boots, barbed wire, prisons everywhere, uh, armored personnel carriers, cameras, microphones hanging out of the trees. They're militarizing against us. And uh, why are they doing that? They're protecting the empire. I mean, the Roman Empire did the same. Uh, every empire that's ever existed on this uh, planet has done the same. They use the populace. The populace uh, revolts or objects. Then they get more strong-handed with the populace. In fact, what they do is well, if the populace objects, they will take more revenue from the populace to make the populace weak. So they cannot object. And currently, right now, they're taking, I hear people screaming all over the country. They're being raped financially, losing their houses, their jobs, everything else, and being threatened with being put in jail if they don't pay the extortion tariff. Yeah, I know people in South Austin who are retired who have like maybe $30,000 in the bank they saved. They have nothing. They have one old car that barely works. And the IRS says, hey, you owe us money. Well, no, I don't. Here's my. We don't want your receipts. Give us ten thousand now, and we'll leave you alone. Oh, we're just taking your house. They have a heart attack. Oh, then they get it all. I mean, and and it's in the name. Well, we gotta, you know, pave the roads and gotta have defense. Well, the course in the road right now, the other path is a thousand years of prosperity. You know, the, the true meaning of the word millennium. We're at a crossroads. We either go into so, total su subjugation, or we go into total independence. We're telling you that they didn't have any money. They were telling you that there was a small surplus, and then we had this big phony fight over who would uh, get little bits and pieces out of it. Uh, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, they're taking over. They own most the stock market. They almost own everything. Do a search on the net for CAFR. Uh, you'll get well, the government's own sites everywhere. What is essential at this point in time, Alex, is to get a model up on the playing field. Once the model is up by example, the game is over. So get a city or county, preferably a county, to do it, Show people taxation phased out in three years. Show people with surpluses on top of that. Show them the fraud that they really own everything and that we supposedly own this country and that everybody else will follow suit if not we're enslaved. You are the leaders out there. You better take action on this, ladies and gentlemen. It's up to you. Thank you for joining us, Walter Berrien.
And then there's the government always telling you, turn in your guns, everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be wonderful. Oh, we had to take those old retired people's home over there in the working class neighborhood. They didn't pay their taxes. Everybody's got to tighten their belt. Well, here is a former Treasury agent, Joe Bannister. In the last two years, Mr. Bannister has gone public on national television, in the newspapers, you name it, about how the IRS is a collection agency for the private run-for-profit Federal Reserve that's, well, running this whole comprehensive annual financial report scam that we've just exposed. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, more and more Americans are fighting this and coming out against the developments. It's time for you to join the team. Many hands make light work. The IRS is a criminal organization. The 16th Amendment was never ratified to give you the income tax. You pay your taxes to the private banks. It's called the New World Order. And now they want a THX 1138 you. That is, dumb you down, 110%. Well, we're here in Northern California, and a few weeks ago, on my radio program, we talked to Joe Bannister. In fact, his story's starting to gain a lot of attention. There's going to be an article in Media Bypass, and he's been doing a lot of uh, radio interviews with uh, people that are interested in the truth of what's really happening. He also has a website uh, that contains the letter that uh, he wrote to the IRS commissioner, Charles Rossetti. And uh, again, his name is Joe Bannister, and he was a special treasury agent assigned to the IRS to investigate uh, people that were filing uh, fraudulent tax returns or simply hiding assets. And uh, thanks a lot for spending some time with us, Mr. Bannister. God bless. Thanks, Alex. Uh, basically, just start out and tell us a little bit about yourself and how how you stumbled upon the truth. Well, I uh, started out as a CPA. I worked in public accounting, and I decided that I wanted a little more excitement, and I decided to uh, become a law enforcement officer with the federal government. Yeah. Well, the Internal Revenue Service is. Uh, his job is to collect income taxes and uh, some excise taxes. And the uh, Criminal Investigation Division, which I was a part, uh, investigates uh, criminal violations of those tax laws. And when did you start to, uh, well, tell us how it all began. What made you first uh, want to investigate uh, the Internal Revenue Code yourself and not just take the manuals and the codes that uh, you used uh, when uh, investigating uh, 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 tax evaders? Well, in December of 1996, I was uh, listening to the radio here in the, the Bay Area, and I heard a lady named D.V. Kidd come on the radio, and she started saying some very unbelievable things, like the income tax was voluntary, that the 16th Amendment was never ratified, and that the uh, that federal income taxes don't go towards providing revenue for the U.S. government. And uh, I thought those claims were awfully outrageous, but she was uh, talking about it on a radio show hosted by a, a man who I trusted, and that made me want to dig deeper and see uh, what, what it was she was saying and what evidence she had to back it up. Absolutely. And so, yeah, 1996, you started investigating. How long did you investigate before you uh, came to your conclusions? Uh, a little over two years. So I... Uh, Basically, my investigation ended right about the time I, I was forced to resign. Can you tell us that story and also get into uh, some of the things that you uncovered that are historical? Well, I, uh, I'd say after a good year, year and a half, I basically in my mind came to the realization that uh, she, all her claims were correct, that in fact the income tax was voluntary, uh, although it, it sounds kind of strange to be saying that because we all know that people go to prison, uh, they lose their homes, uh, they have their wages garnished. But um, the reason that the uh, IRS c constantly refers to the income tax as being voluntary is uh, because of our U.S. Constitution and the severe limitations that are placed on the federal government's ability to tax us. So. Uh, you know, there are only certain forms of constitutional taxation. That's correct. That our income taxes do not, you know, provide revenue as I always believe they did. Uh, it's more like a, uh, a cash advance type system where the federal government borrows uh, fiat money from the Federal Reserve, and then our income taxes are used as a, a vehicle to pay interest on that debt.
Well, the uh, the printing of the money. Another thing that I found out, which which totally surprised me, uh, was that they they print the money, and there's n there's no value to it, and they in a sense print it and out of, out of nothing. They make it out of nothing, uh, simply because they have the power to uh, to force us to use the currency. And it's kind of like a rat in a maze. And we never question the maze itself, never think outside the box. And that's why you're rare. Well, more and more people are in government standing up. This is coming more and more clear. But it's still rare in the IRS, Mr. Bannister, uh, for somebody to actually pull back and see this. Uh, what was it like, let's say, a year into your studies? Because you say you studied for about two years before you finally made your decision with the evidence. What was it like about a year into it? Uh, it was very difficult because I, I took the job um, thinking that I could use my financial skills to fight crime, go after the bad guys, uh, and, I, and I did. You know, money launderers, uh, drug smugglers, uh, one particular case was even featured on America's Most Wanted, so I, I was really enjoying myself. So it really uh, <clears throat> it shook my belief system to its very foundations and uh, it was really very difficult for me to continue um, doing the job and, and um, excelling at it because my, my, my mental state was, it was difficult, you know, to go to work every day, even though I wasn't daily, you know, arresting um, tax evaders or people that didn't file tax returns. I wasn't personally doing that, but uh, I still just felt really, it was very difficult to just go through the day-to-day -day process of the job knowing what I was finding out and uh, not Because like you it. found out that you were putting people in jail for something that the very system itself was doing. At least the agency as a whole was doing that and I felt that sooner or later I needed to start uh, speaking out publicly uh, because I felt, you know, clearly a tax can only be voluntary or mandatory and if it, it is voluntary then it is wrong and illegal to uh, prosecute, harass, seize money from people who don't volunteer. Where does the money go? They throw this fiat money out there, we take the money up, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, we put labor into it, we work to attain it, and thus they steal our labor. In, in a sense, that's correct. I mean, for, for quite some time, uh, I'd hear DV Kidd talking about, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve and how we're, we're slaves, and I didn't really understand what she meant, but when you really spend a little time and educate yourself on, on the way the process works. It's really very simple economics, and I'm, I don't have an economics degree or anything like that, but you can, you can eventually see that when the source of the money supply is a bank and the destination of the money supply is a bank, and the they, controller of the money supply is a bank and the interest rates, that's total, complete monopoly. It's a money trust. You basically have no, you, you can't get out of, out of the slavery. You can't get out of the, the constantly increasing supply of money, which is another thing I noticed and never really thought about, is that although they constantly will tell you that we're trying to keep inflation under control, we're trying to minimize it, minimize the effects of it, uh, if you look at it over a period of decades, it's always going up. It never goes down or, or disappears. It's basically on a, an upward tilt forever and ever and ever. The economics of it, eventually, it ends up destroying the economy and, uh, and the people in it. You have to ask yourself, why would this global system want to do that? It's just all about power. It's modern colonialism. Well, again, it, it's, it's economic slavery, and it's, such a, it's something that it took me till the age of 35 uh, to, to go out and do my own personal investigation to understand how it works. I never learned it in, at the university, didn't learn it on the CPA exam, didn't learn it in the big eight accounting firm, and certainly didn't learn it at the IRS. That's but, right. You went to one of the biggest and best accounting schools. Uh, well, I worked three years at KPMG Pete Marwick, um, but I never never was taught. Uh, I had to go out and learn it on my own, and luckily uh, DV Kidd was on a, a radio station that I gave some credibility to. If I had heard her just on a street corner or at a meeting somewhere, I probably would have just kept on uh, walking. And I mean, uh, just basically, is there anything you want to say to the people in Austin, Texas, in Central Texas, the people that tape this show and send it out to friends and family as well? I guess the only thing I would say is uh, I, I've seen uh, evidence of an orchestrated campaign of painting a broad brush uh, over people like Alex who uh, really are telling you the truth. and. Um, 
I was one of those people that thought these were all kooky ideas, but I've come to realize that they are uh, very true and very serious. And I'm very afraid for my own uh, uh, family, uh, our own uh, the Americans' ability to make a living, to have a country that has a manufacturing base, uh, to have a future. Uh, our country is close to being destroyed economically through the banking and monetary system. And it's about time that people realize that they're being lied to and they should start listening uh, to people like Alex because he is telling you the truth. I've checked it out. And then what happened when you tried to show this to your superiors? Well, there came a point when I realized that um, what I had to do was consolidate all of my evidence and facts into uh, a central location. So I decided to um, write a report. And it's very similar to what I do in the, uh, in the Treasury Department, which was I'd investigate an allegation. I'd uh, go out and interview witnesses, gather evidence, gather documents, follow the paper trail, and then summarize all that evidence and present a report to my superiors which would either recommend pro that the um, person be prosecuted or recommend that the investigation be discontinued because there was not enough evidence uh, to sustain a, a prosecution. So I put that evidence together and uh, I submitted it to my immediate superior and I asked that it be submitted right up the chain to Commissioner Rosati. Uh, I realized that what I was doing was uh, you know, was going to rock the boat quite a bit, but I also knew that I had checked every one of these facts out and was a hundred, over 100% hundred certain of my findings. On February 8th of 1999 is actually the day that I submitted my report, and I asked that the commissioner or his designee commit in writing within 30 days to review my report. And it was only, I was only asking for a commitment. I didn't say, I want all the answers in 30 days. Just, just commit to me, you'll look, look at it. I'm a federal law enforcement officer. I've sworn to support and defend the Constitution, and I really see some serious constitutional problems with the income, federal income tax. So that was February 8th. February 11th, it went to my boss's boss. And from February 11th to February 17th, it went all the way to 1111 Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. And that's Rossetti's office. That's where Rosati, uh, his office is, as well as the Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation. And I was told that uh, my report not only went to Constitution Avenue, but uh, at a minimum, the Assistant Commissioner for Criminal Investigation was aware of, of my report and m the basics for what I was and Believe presenting. me, your report went right to Alan Greenspan. <laughs> Or a word of it, a briefing did. Well, uh, it turns out that on the, let's see. Well, see, that's the one thing they guard is the, at the upper levels, is the great evil. And the one thing they cannot deal with, that they, they cannot stop is credible people from within their system coming out against them. And now you're doing magazine interviews and radio interviews, and you've got the evidence, you've got your website up. Listen, what would you say, before we finish the story, what would you say to the other IRS agents and the other law enforcement out there about this? I mean, you've, you've taken a real risk here in what you've done. I'm, I'm taking a, an incredible risk, but uh, I believe that the risk of doing nothing is, is even worse. Uh, what, what federal law enforcement officers need to realize, as well as every state and local officer, is that the laws that the IRS agents are enforcing, uh, they shouldn't be enforcing. And I don't believe that they should be cooperated with if uh, somebody is being prosecuted for failing to file a tax return and they have uh, done the research and found that there is no requirement to file a tax return, then I feel it's uh, morally and legally wrong you know, for, for those, that person to be pursued, investigated, and prosecuted. You're saying it's color of law is, what, is what's being used. The whole thing's run out of ignorance. People just don't know. They really think, look at those kooks, those weirdos, those liars, until you investigate. That's right, and I feel, I feel uh, bad that I spent time thinking those things, but it was out of ignorance. And now that I've uh, researched and found that a lot of, what, a lot of those uh, claims are actually true, uh, my hope is that law enforcement people will start trusting the citizens more than they have, 
and the citizens hopefully when they see more law enforcement officers being honorable about about these issues will start to trust law enforcement again and we can get back to a country where there's a lot of trust between the government and the governed because it's only with the consent of the government that the government does, uh, exists. I'm, I'm trying to hope that you guys can tune out from the sports and the bedlam and the diversions for just five minutes and realize what we're trying to tell you here. What we're trying to wake you up. I mean, th this is some scary stuff. I mean, I'll pay taxes. I've said this a hundred times. But my gosh, let it go to me and my family. Let it go to the country. Let it go to defense of this nation. Let it be honest and based in a strong, good nation. But, but if it's going to private banks, and they feed it back into the cycle of slavery, and there's no way to get out of this debt pit. In fact, as an accountant, Mr. Bannister, explain the whole debt pit. I mean, explain, explain how there's no way to dig yourself out of this fiat system. I mean, you basically said it right there. You, it is a pit, and you never get out. You pay interest. You, you pay the, the sweat of your brow pays, barely pays the interest on the debt. It never goes away. It's like indentured servitude. It's like indentured servitude. It, it's it literally... Uh, as you work, you keep hoping for the day that that debt is paid off and you are free, but it'll never come with the system as it stands. I mean, I remember agents going to so-called tax protester meetings as, you know, to get intelligence and find out what's, what's going on, and I remember them coming back and, and laughing at, you know, the kooky stuff that they were talking about, and, you know, so that was just the general uh, feeling that had been incul inculcated into people's minds. And uh, it took me a couple of years to, to find out, but it, it in fact... Now, that's right. You, you talked about uh, D.B. Kidd and other writers and her pamphlets and, and the executive orders they listed and the, and the laws, the case law. What happened that first time whenever you went to the law library? Because you told that story on the radio, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, that I, I expected to find that it was all baloney, that they referred to court cases that didn't exist or they took court cases out of context. And uh, I found that every court case that she referred to or any of the people that she had in her book list referred to were correct and they were right in the uh, law library. And uh, what type, I mean, how did that make you feel? I guess you wanted to dig deeper. Yeah, because I, you know, I had been uh, taught or at least uh, led to believe that I would immediately find the error of the evidence that it wouldn't be there. That, so you know, they actually told you these guys are nothing but liars. You can't trust them. Yeah. Why? Why bother looking? There's no sense in even look, looking into it because it's, uh, you know, a bunch of useless, out of context arguments that have been strung together, and they don't make any sense. Mr. Bannister, have you got any calls since you've gone public and doing all these radio and magazine interviews? Have you got any calls back from the IRS? Uh, no, but I have. I've. I do have a lot of support within the IRS. There's, like I said, there's a lot of good people in there, and uh, they are supportive of me. Uh, of course, there's some that don't understand, but they haven't they haven't read any of the evidence either. So you're you're a good example again. I mean, if you realize what you've done here, it's, it's so good. If we can convince the people in the mechanisms of enforcement that, that they're enforcing something that's criminal, we can try to get back to that constitutional form of taxation and have a strong country. Well, there's, uh, I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with a gentleman named Jack McLam. Yes, Police uh, Against the New World Order. I'm under, you know, I understand that he's uh, very, he's not well liked by, by government officials, and I've met him a number of times, and I find him to be a very uh, gentle man and uh, somebody that just wants the Constitution to be followed. He's and not a criminal. He's a, he's a highly decorated Vietnam veteran, the most highly decorated police officer in Phoenix, Arizona history, and he was at the top. I mean, they loved him in the community. They were talking about him going for chief, all the rest of this stuff, and uh, finally he found out about drug running and things and corruption and tried to speak about it, and he got fired. And the thing about, thing about Jack is uh, he's got a, a little saying that uh, tyranny will come to your door in a uniform, and I, I can't think of a more uh, true statement, and especially... Uh, Coming from me, who um, kicked down a lot of doors and uh, did a lot of search warrants and searched through a lot of drawers and files and under beds, that uh, that's exactly how tyranny will come to your home, is in a uniform or with a bulletproof vest on or with a six-hour nine-millimeter as I carried. And again, it's up to you guys out there in America, the police, uh, the SWAT team commanders. Um, 
you ought to ask yourselves, is, is it the crack dealer on the corner, or is it the white-collar criminal that you're worried about, the guy that's selling old ladies junk bonds, or, or is it just the family that can't put the kids through school because of the federal income tax that goes right to the Federal Reserve? Again, that's true, private, run for profit. You know, we've, we've aired the actual training videos the IRS has, or pieces of it, where they admit that it goes right to the Federal Reserve. In fact, more and more, they're just admitting the truth, aren't they? They're just flagrantly out there flapping in their faces. Well, I, a lot of what I found is, actually all of what I found is publicly available. And uh, it, I mean, the number of times that you see the word voluntary in the IRS manuals and in their uh, pamphlets and uh, booklets and instructions, I found it to be incredible. So the king has no clothes. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I found. In fact, I think that's what we'll call this piece, The King Has No Clothes. Joe, anything else? And God bless you. You know, Joe worked hard today um, uh, at the accounting firm he's working at. And uh, we were in Northern California covering Operation Urban Warrior. Oh, my gosh. And uh, we called Joe up, and he was uh, he met us right after work here at this little restaurant. Joe, any other points? Uh, again, just don't, don't uh, let people be painted with a broad brush where uh, you're scared into not listening to what they have to say. Uh, DV Kidd, Bill Benson, Bill Conklin, Jack McLam, uh, and many, many others uh, are fine people, and they really have seen some very ugly, the very ugly underside of uh, certain portions of our government. And I'm not anti-government. I'm not anti-tax. I don't. I don't. Alex is not. Uh, none of the people are. Yeah, they are. They are anti-corruption, though. And I'm anti-corruption, and uh... well, that's the sad part. You sit there and you try to talk about corruption, police running drugs, which we talked about, election fraud. Remember that at the county, and then it comes out it's true months after we bring it out, and nothing's done. We're denied, you know, being on the committee. We get called anti-government, black helicopter people, all the rest of this stuff, and it's only because, well, number one, I get a thrill out of standing up against corruption. I think that's the same thrill you got. I mean, it, it feels good, and I guess it did feel bad to find out that you've been let along. That's the reason I took the job. I could use my financial skills to find the fraud, to chase after the bad guys who don't actually get their fingers dirty with the crime. But the money ends up flowing, and you follow the money. The puppet masters that create the habit. And, and that's, you know, you find who's running the, running the show when you follow the money. Joe's got a website, and uh, you can get all the information uh, that was inside his brief that he wrote to his superiors, pretty much calling for a criminal investigation of the system. And what's your website again, Joe? The website is www.freedomabovefortune.com. That's all one word, freedomabovefortune.com. Freedomabovefortune.com. And again, we're Since we first interviewed Mr. Bannister, again, he's been in the USA Today, C-SPAN, and... Uh, as we're making this tape, 60 Minutes is getting ready to do a hit piece on him. And three other high-level criminal investigators from the IRS have quit, and the numbers are only growing of those that are leaving but not going public. The truth is out. Private banks run this country. They're building prison camps everywhere. They're building prisons everywhere. They're trying to push a move in the mainstream media to disarm the American people using incrementalism. We face total dehumanization. You now know the truth about the comprehensive annual financial reports and the fact that county, city, state, federal governments are creating giant armed compound empires against us. They own over 70% of the stock market, and they keep sucking the money back out of us that they create with fiat, stealing our labor, our homes, dumbing down our children. There's 80 million gun owners in this country. They're pushing right now to disarm us. We have to refuse to become disarmed serfs in this country, or the tyranny is going to get really bad. This so-called war on terrorism is really a war on free individuals, no matter whether you're black or white, young or old. This is a fight against dehumanization, ladies and gentlemen. Make copies of this tape. Spread this information. Check it out for yourself. We're telling you the truth. This is a giant battle for our republic. The elite wants everything for themselves. This is the fight for humanity. It's that serious. Thank you for watching. Now take action. Many hands make light work.